Yeah, the separation of church and state in America, um, a subject that really needs to be discussed here on History is here to help. I'm Jay, I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, the handsome young man is Peter Hoffenberg, and he is going to introduce our guest, who is a UH professor at the School of American Studies, Cass Sands. Uh, okay, Peter, go for it. Well, thank you. Neither young nor handsome, but thanks. You're off to a good, <laughs> a good start talking about separation of church and states. Uh, anyhow, we have a, a great opportunity today to discuss this large issue with one of our full professors from American Studies, uh, Kathleen M. Sands, who is an expert on, on this and many complementary issues. Let me just briefly uh, introduce her as holding advanced degrees from Harvard Divinity School and Boston College. I don't know if you were a colleague of Avi's back there at BC in Chestnut Hill or not, our dear friend Avi Soifer. Uh, fascinating uh, in that Dr. Sands is trained in theology and has moved beyond the specifics of theology to talk about religiosity, religion, uh, sexuality, religion historically, law, public life, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what critical religious studies is, but I understand that's also, and maybe we can come back and talk about that. Uh, we've really asked her here, besides the fact that she's a superb scholar and teacher, uh, because of her immediate interest in uh, religion and public life in America, and how we can think about that both historically and contemporary terms. If you go to the library, uh, please check America's Religious Wars, The Embattled Heart of Our Public Life from Yale, 2019, Mazel Tov, and then your current book project, uh, What's Wrong with Religious Freedom? Question mark. So welcome, and we look forward to our chat, and it usually ends up rescheduling a second, a second chat. So please don't, <laughs> don't feel free, you need to say everything in these 28 minutes. Welcome, aloha. Sure, thank you for yeah. having me. So uh, Cass, you know, this is really an interesting subject, especially in our times, uh, although we don't talk about it so much in, in the public conversation, the reality is that religion uh, is, 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 is there in the divisive condition of our country right now. Um, so I guess this is a, a, a sweeping question, but how has it changed here in these United States? <clears throat> how has it changed here in these United States since the founders uh, you know, wrote the First Amendment and the Establishment Clause? It's, it seems to me, looking over this history, uh, that there are two fundamental ways that Americans have had of speaking of religion. One I call separationist discourse in which religion is spoken of as very individual, very separate. It involves mainly beliefs. It's an area of diversity, not commonality. Um, and it's purely voluntary. That's separationist discourse. And I think that's really what you see in the religion clauses is a separationist notion of religion. But alongside it, there's always been a foundationalist notion of religion. And in the foundationalist notion of religion, religion, re religion is understood more generically um, and it's understood as connected with civilization, with citizenship, with general norms. Um, and it is not really voluntary. I mean, technically it's voluntary, um, but in practice, it's not voluntary. For instance, if a person were to run for president and openly be an atheist, it would be very hard for them to, to get anywhere. <laughs> so I'm not saying that's how it should be, but I think that's how it is. So we've got these two discourses, and today they have become polarized. One is either a foundationalist, which usually means a white Christian nationalist today, or one is a separationist. So it almost, it, the discourse is almost polarized to where one is either for religion or against it, which is, as we religious progressives know, that's a terrible terrible sort of polarization um, to make. But it wasn't that way at the founding. In the founding, and the best example of this is Washington's farewell address, where he says that the, one of the essential conditions for um, a good, good polity is religion and morality. And he says it you know, that we share, we basically share the same religion, manners, morals, and habits. And so just, and of course, what are manners, morals, and habits in captured in that broad phrase is a whole set of social conventions and hierarchies that he's assuming. And then what, what, what religious freedom means is that within that broad category that is very, very conventional, you get to choose which way you do it. 
so that was pretty much the case through through the Civil War. After the Civil War, those two discourses sort of came apart, and that's where we are now. Mm, did they ever come apart? Yeah. So <clears throat> we're we're on we're we're on the second uh, category you mentioned, and it seems to be overcoming the first category. Absolutely. <clears throat> and Absolutely. Uh, yeah. you know, I was telling you before the show my understanding, and I don't know if Peter has the same contact with this issue, uh, is that at the outset, uh, um, you know, the, the deal was, we will give you tax exemption. Uh, we won't, we won't tax you for your properties, we'll kind of leave you alone. Uh, and this doesn't, it's not limited to religion. It's, it's all viable nonprofits, I guess. But religion was the first big nonprofit you can think of. Right. Um, we'll leave you alone, just stay out of our government, stay Stay away from trying to, you know, force your religion on others and on public policy. And that's the deal. It's a compact we, we make mm -hmm. underlying the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, but we've, we've given that up somewhere along the line. And I suspect it's, it's relatively recent where we have, we have dropped that. So still, uh, the churches get all these tax exemptions and special benefits. Mm -hmm. Government leaves them alone largely. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't regulate them very much, mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and they in turn now they they, they have forgotten uh, the compact, and they go in actively oh, yeah. uh, and try to uh, force public opinion. And I'm thinking of um, you know um, the Roe v. Wade, the Dobbs case, uh, where the church has been you know heavily involved. Um, I'm thinking of um, oh yeah, uh, oh of course uh, 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 gay marriage. Same-sex marriage, big oh, one with the church yes. heavily involved, mm -hmm. um, and in the state of Hawaii, um, death with dignity, mm -hmm. heavily involved. Uh, the church has, um, you know, opposed that in every which way for thirty years. Yes, and it took thirty years to get the bill passed, and yeah. and then it was like Swiss cheese anyway. Yeah, because of all the lobbying over the language. That's right. Um, so what you have now is um, it, it's not the compact; it's different. Uh, and religion has taken a huge um, swath of public opinion, yeah. including heavy political issues, as we see. Oh, yeah. Right now oh, yeah. I mean, since the 1980s, since the Reagan era, um, that has been the case. Wheeling back a little bit before that, you know, church state jurisprudence really only gets going in the in the mid um, in the mid 20th century, right? It's only in 1940 and 1947 that the religion clauses begin to be applied to the states. And after that, you have a period of uh, through about um, the late 80s when that Noah Feldman calls, you know, the age of, of legal secularism, when there was a strong separation of church and state. And what was new about it, really, Protestants had always believed in the separation of church and state. It's just that they applied it to Catholics. <laughs> to them, it meant <laughs> separation of Catholicism. Uh, what, what happened at that time that was so um, disruptive to men, to, you know, white Christian America, was that the Establishment Clause started to be applied against them. So you couldn't do their prayers and their hymns in the public schools. And their moral point of view was no longer to reign supreme. So that went on until the late 80s, and then it fell apart um, with the rise of the religious right in the Reagan era. Yes. So something has definitely, definitely changed. You, can I just drill down a little on what you said, the rise of religious rights in the Reagan era? The religious uh, right, yes. What, what, so of how, the religious how did that right. happen in this country? What, what, what were the forces and vectors and considerations yeah. that made that happen here? Yeah. Um, the, the popular narrative about how that happened is it happened in response to Roe versus Wade in 1973. Um, but a historian named Randall Balmer has written, I think very convincingly, that its deeper roots are actually in desegregation. That when schools began to be desegregated, um, you started to see, especially in the South, the rise of what many people call segregation academies. And they were Christian academies. Right, um, and they were getting, uh, they they were not getting tax funding at that time because they were religious schools, and it's that that Ronald Reagan appealed to when he his in his famous 
meeting um, in 1980 when he speaks before the, the Ministers Association. He says, I, you can't, I can't, no, let's see, he says, you can't endorse me, but I can endorse you. He's really referring to those segregation academies wanting to get tax exemptions. That's what really started it. He doesn't mention abortion. And in fact, abortion doesn't come into it until later. So there's a strong strain of white supremacy right from the beginning, even though, you know, by, I don't know, the late eighties or the nineties, they're starting to disidentify with that. You know, they're pushing that away. But I do think that is the real origins. I wanna to come to your class. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. There's there's room. Come on in. So okay. So now you know it's very interesting because in this phenomenon or this combination of phenomena, um, you you have um, very strange results where one religion wants to get on top and push down other religions. You know the Absolutely. Jews will not replace us. Um, yes. Or, <laughs> Or, or this thing about, uh, you know, in, in the case of Dobbs and Roe v. Wade, um, there, there are parts of the Jewish religion that say abortion is good. You need to do that. The rabbi will advise you to do that, an yes. obligation to do that. Yeah, you're well, required. If the, yes. if the woman's health is at risk, Jewish law says you are required, you're required yes. to have the abortion. Yeah, yes. it's, not, it's not even a choice. If right. the woman, <laughs> it's, it's her, if her life is at risk, boom, then yeah. you do it. Yeah, and there's no, there's no rabbi, no orthodox rabbi. Yes. Pearson would not disagree with that. The, the other thing is, this is, aside from being racial, and maybe race is geographic, you know, if you look at the blue and the red, and this is so many in, interesting overlays between, you know, the yeah. states, um, mm -hmm. you find that, um, you know, religion is practiced differently in different places in the country. Sure. I know it's, that's not a perfect statement, but I, you know, I think if you went into the, the red states in the South, religion would be seen differently. How, yeah, did that, how did that happen? And what does that mean to us? Well, some of it is about, of course, the Civil War, you know, and um, the, the regional differences that come from that. I think in a, in a broader sense, there are parts, it's not just that there's rural and urban, right? We know that's true, but there's also mobile and less mobile. So there's, there's, you know, city folk, like I assume us more or less are that, are very mobile. We've lived in a lot of different places. Um, in, the, in, in the Midwest and in the South, you much more commonly have folks who really identify with their place for generations. And so I think that um, race or ethnicity and place are more deeply connected for some people than for others. And I think that is a fundamentally sort of conservative impulse. It mm -hmm. creates a fundamentally conservative impulse. And it's very true. Religion, the different religions are also, uh, look, they have different theologies. Uh, people yeah. practice them differently. And I think that's one of the issues that we have to deal with. Uh, most Americans are religious in one way or another, but they define religion differently. Absolutely. And that's an important element. I think that uh, Reagan was able to appeal particularly to the evangelical uh, obsession with uh, the martyrdom of Christ and a lot of the discourse. That's not, you don't have that in Judaism. <laughs> you don't have that in Islam or Buddhism. So I think in this discussion, I absolutely agree with everything you said, Kath. I think we also need, though, to, uh, using Jay's term, drill down a little bit and see you know, what in this congregation, how do they understand religion? Mm -hmm. Therefore, how they understand religion and somebody else. So for example, if you looked at Shrub Bush's congregation, it's multi-ethnic, multi-racial. In Texas, mm -hmm. some of the most multi-racial institutions are evangelical churches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have to begin to think about what, what does that social environment mean to those people and how they perceive religion? What do you think? And, what are what do you think? What are your thoughts about that, Peter? Well, my, my thoughts are, are very much uh, partially along your lines of where people have lived. I think it's one of the reasons uh, religion is very important in Hawaii. Spirituality is very important right. in Hawaii. And it has uh, a lot both, to do with for actually both okay. reasons. Both reasons. Yeah. I know living here a long time, but also people moving and feeling alien. Yeah. And there it serves a very social, I don't want to be reductionist, functionalist, but it, it serves a particular purpose. Also, it enables you to connect with co-religiousness elsewhere, like we've seen in the white Christian nationalism. And right. why should uh, some right. woman in Idaho care about Hungary, right? Which right. is what we're seeing. Okay, 
So that's part of it. And I think in a way it gets back to Jay's um, initial question is that, and, and what you said originally, that for some, religion is a separate sphere. And they practice their religion that way. And they don't have any particular connection. Look, it's the old fear of the Pope and Roman Catholics, right? Kennedy <laughs> even had to de deal with that. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is your identity as a religious person, meaning what does religion mean for you? All right, so are you Orthodox? Whatever the Orthodox is. Mm -hmm. In the book, the direct reading of the book. Mm -hmm. Okay, but having said that, you could be an Orthodox Jew and not really care about the rest of the world, right? Mm -hmm. The Orthodox Jews don't, I mean, Jay, Jay and I are infidels as reformed yeah, Jews. Yeah, sure, okay. right. So part of it is an intellectual exercise relationship sure. with the book. Yeah. Okay. And I think going back to Jay's original question, uh, the difficulty is the founding parents uh, left us right in the middle. I mean, the French Revolution was clear. You need to have a secular society. And France has always been this way. And part of the backlash against Muslims is the Republic is secular. Well, the founding parents didn't quite <laughs> go in that direction. They didn't envision. Would you say more about um, I think thoughts? some of them, I think some of them would have, but they didn't uh, for a whole variety of reasons. The fact that most white Americans in the colonies were very religious. Mm -hmm. They came here, right, as a, you know, ma uh, city. Sure, they came here for, for, because they were persecuted in Europe. Um, you know, some were persecuted. Um, some uh, didn't get what they want, that they wanted. But that doesn't equal persecution. I mean, there, yes, there was persecution in France, certainly, and in Britain. But see, not everybody, see there not is everybody, equality, right? Not everybody <laughs> who came here <laughs> was put in jail for not it. Not at all. Yeah, what they did have, all. though, you know, is the way that most Americans have always thought. It was a tabula rasa. So Native Americans had no religion. This was a blank slate. But what the founding parents had then, and Jay, we talked about with this with the Articles of Confederation, there's kind of a states' rights to religion, right? I mean, Catholics were in Maryland. There were not a lot of Catholics outside of Maryland. Right. All right. You're not a lot of Quakers. Right. So I think we're still dealing with the fact that from the get go, as Kat said, religion was centered. In that case, it was on a colony. And from the get go, there was, there was no real way to legislate that separation. So I'm going to be the pain in the tushy and say religion <laughs> and politics have always been integrated. Yeah. You would not have the abolitionist movement without Christians in the North. Yeah. So in a way, what we're dealing with is, you know, do I have the right to deny you an alleged right? But mm -hmm. the abolitionists quite clearly said that's not a kosher right to enslave somebody, mm -hmm. enslave somebody. But the debate about Dobbs, right, is who, who, who gets to call what is the primary right according to religious terms? And we talked about this last time. We have yeah. to get out this way in which it's kind of a zero-sum game. Yeah. If well, I think, I think there's, yeah. there's three three things to consider to connect the dots on this and and make it, you know, get, sort of get a comprehensive on it. Mm -hmm. Number one is, where did it start? Number two, we've covered that to some extent. I think we could spend a lot more time covering that. We should again. And, like and uh, the second is, where are we now? We're, we're talking about that now, and we, we have yet to talk about some of the uh, religious religion cases coming out of the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Um, but the third is, and, and to me, this is we really need to spend at least a little time on this. Uh, and that is, where is it going? You know, it's it's one thing to make your religion, you know, superior to the next guys, and have your religion affect public policy more than the next guys. But then, inherent in that, you know, in the dynamic is bigotry itself. Yes. We get back to pogroms and and um, you know harassment and beating people up and having violence over religious arguments. It's um, also just the roll of the die. It's the roll of the die at six to three. In 35 years, it could be six to, I mean, that's part of the problem with the decision. It's not only the court, the though. It's not only the court. Yeah. You know, one of the points we've discussed uh, on this show, I think, um, is, you know, the Inquisition, um, you know, back in the 13th, 14th century, um, 15th century. Um, uh, the Inquisition did not come from the royalty. It came from the people on the street who were bigots um, because, uh, you know, they, they, were, they were envious, maybe, of other people. And, and, the, and the royalty realized that this was a political instrument they could use. This was a leverage point they could use mm -hmm. to enhance their own power. 
So you get you get bigotry on the streets, and then all of a sudden the government is using that yes, as a political mm-hmm. instrument. Um, anyway, so I, I, inherent in our discussion, I think, should be where is this going? It's not just the courts; it's the it's everybody. I agree. It, you know. So, so, but go ahead. I was just going to wheel back for just just a briefly, real quick, um, to to what Peter was discussing, uh, interestingly about origins and stuff. Um, it seems to me, you know, in Europe, the arrangement at the time that the American colonies started was, was not disestablishment of religion, but regional establishments, right? So if you were in Germany, you know, you were Lutheran. If you were in Spain, you were Catholic and so forth. If you were in Great Britain, you were Anglican or else you were like marginalized. And what the, um, those who migrated and settled uh, to the U.S. did essentially was set up regional establishments also, <laughs> So religion was regionally established. In most cases, New York was sort of an exception, but either in a smallish way that you had to say you believed in God or in a very big way that you had to belong to a church. So it's Roger Williams, right, in the 17th century who comes up with the metaphor of separation of church and state, um, the wall and the garden. And that was a very, um, you know, there had to be a wall of separation to protect, to protect the garden, the church from the wilderness. Um, that was a very controversial statement. I mean, Williams gets kicked out of Massachusetts for, for that. Um, but, and Williams's idea gets picked up, of course, by Thomas Jefferson, who famously repeats that metaphor. Um, and then later by the Supreme Court, it um, picks up that, that metaphor. Um, what I, the, the only thing I really wanna say about that right now is that when you speak of religion um, as separate from government, um, this is a, uh, you are deciding, in how you use the word religion, you're deciding what government should and should not do. Right, you're so deciding the word, who's a citizen. You're deciding who gets to be a citizen. Who, who's a citizen, and on the flip side of it, what are the role, what is the role and what are the limits of government? What I want to say, though, is that the word religion, it's not a natural category at all. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, a, it, it, it's a descript, it's, it's really a regulatory category posing as a descriptive category. You know, religion isn't clear, you know, isn't naturally defined with certain boundaries so that some things are religious and some things are secular. We are making that boundary over time and in history for certain purposes, some of which are wonderful, like for people to claim their freedom and dignity, some of which are not so great, like for people to claim special privileges. But the term is really best understood as a regulatory term. And the secular is just like the fraternal twin of the religious. They are both, neither of them is a natural term. You have to come back to talk about that. Yeah, that's that's it. That's the $64,000 question. (laughs) Why do I get to claim my 501c is religion? That's right, (laughs) there you you go. There you go. And that gets back to your point about an atheist, why atheism isn't religion. <laughs> that's right. I, that's a great topic. We gotta yeah. come, we'll back, come back talk to about it. that. That's been, okay. And that's linked for us to citizenship. Yes, and I think it is. as you say, uh, to give the founding parents some credit, right? We gotta remember, as you said, most all of them came from, except for Holland, they came from societies and polities in which there was an established church, which did keep you out of politics often kept you out of land, et cetera. So yes, that right. way, Jay, you're right. They, they came here because very often, as we say about the Quakers, they came to do good and they did very well, thank you, because they didn't have <laughs> economic opportunities. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's where I think we get the notion of the establishment clause. That before before, we, before we talk about coming back, let's talk about these cases that have been yeah, handed sure. down. Sure. So we have three to talk about. We have we have Dobbs uh, reversing Roe v. Wade. We have the, the main case involving uh, support to schools, religious schools. Mm-hmm. And we have the Bremerton, Washington case involving the prayer on the football field. And I also want to, you know, talk about Cass' book and how that and how yeah, that definitely. relates to all this. And, and, and this is all in aid um, of, um, you know, of connecting the dots to see where we are going. Okay. Uh, Kat, the floor is yours. So the cases uh, are, as as you've already said, um, we have them up there, yes, okay. Carson versus Mackin or Macon, uh, which is about um, religious schools receiving public funding in Maine. Kennedy versus Bremerton, which is about a football coach who used a religious freedom argument successfully to, uh, to, to be permitted 
to kneel on the 50 yard line in front of a crowd and say his prayers. And then the third case that we've mentioned that's so important, um, Dobbs versus Jackson. Did I get that backwards, Peter? No, that's right. Dobbs, Dobbs, Dobbs is challenging Dobbs Jackson. Versus, uh, Dobbs Health versus Center. Jackson. Health Center. Health Center. Yeah. That reversed Roe versus Wade, which is, of course, um, in the eyes of the court, actually is not a religion case. It's mm -hmm. very important to them that it not be a religion case. Because if it were religion, it could implicate the Establishment Clause. So to them, it's absolutely not about religion. And that's the clever that's, argumentation of the anti-abortionists to use science. That's, that's right. Their, that's, that's where we right. fell off the slippery road so, when we and, decided you know, viability or not as a scientific matter, then the court can feel comfortable. With that. That's exactly right. Yeah. Now here you see religion functioning as a regulatory term. What gets called religion, what gets called secular are really functioning to, to move power around. But let me comment on, um, on the ones that mm -hmm. are specifically about religion. So Carson versus Macon, of course, is as, as you guys said, uh, Maine uh, has a limit on on how uh, because there's the population is low. There's a lot of places that don't have public schools, so they have these schools that are called uh, that can be approved to receive public funds. Private schools that can be approved to receive public funds. The argument became, um, ex I'm sorry, except except if you were quote sectarian. Sectarian mm -hmm. is a loaded term. Sectarian, non-sectarian, again regulative regulative terms that were used throughout the 19th century. Um, and in the study of religion, those, those terms don't fly very well anymore at all. Um, so the school said, well, why can't we, why can't we get um, public funds to send our kids to religious schools? And they used a religious freedom argument. What's interesting here is that the, the religion clauses have become so unbalanced now. It used to be that establishment would place a curb on religious freedom and vice versa. Here, the very fact that Maine was not willing to fund religious schools because of its desire to comply with the establishment clause, their very concern with that was taken as an assault on religious freedom. So the, the schools, the, uh, the, the religious schools win. In Kennedy uh, versus Bremerton, again, the issue is religion on both sides. Kennedy, um, who wants to pray on the 50 yard line, is making that argument specifically because it's religion. And the school is telling him he can't do it specifically because it's religion. Um, and the, again, the change in the way the doctrine works is that you know, 40 years ago, the school's concern with complying with the religion clause would be taken very, very seriously. Now, the very fact that Bremerton was up trying to apply the Establishment Clause, the very fact that they're trying to separate church and state is taken as evidence of discrimination against religion. And so again, he wins. I would say that the problem is the category of religion. I mean, that's where I go with this. Yeah, and I would have a less intellectual response that each of these are steps to dismantle what these people think is the great society. Each yes, the, I, the, I agree. The I completely uh, to agree. remove the brick from the great society. Uh, I don't even think that uh, McConnell cares about abortion. Uh, I mean, I think he cares about you know liberal quote unquote regulations and immigration, et cetera. And I think he's going to rue the day <laughs> that he put justices on the court who made abortion such a big issue. You can uh -huh, even see him. Of, he's backpedaling already on the midterms because he yeah. knows. But I think um, yeah, yeah. the matter, and we could have a wonderful discussion about the, the great society. Yeah. But you ask our students to give 10 criteria of the great society, mm -hmm. eight or nine are attacked. Now, or I, I think that a, I think that connect, are being attacked. And I think that connects the dots. Um, uh, establishment as, you know, strict secularism, quote unquote, boom. Women's well, right. Uh, you boom. know, when, when you know, uh, public health, boom. I mean, these are all assume uh, and voting. Let's look at voting. I mean, one of the most important elements. Is being packed. So that I, I can say, Jay and, and Kath, that, that would be my wider view. Sure. Sometimes we need to, it's very important to drill down, as Jay said, but sometimes you got to step back a little bit. Yeah. These are, see, I completely see agree. this large yeah. pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and interesting enough, of course, the large pattern is a minority view because <laughs> people who support the great society or have benefit from the great society are overwhelmingly a numerical majority in our country. 
Well, yeah, and we have we have we have a very important and profound change happening. That's what we have, and uh, you know it's uh, it's really on the way. If you look for a trend here, you find the trend is the establishment clause as we used to know it is going away. I agree, uh, and it's a question not only of law but social policy and social sensibility is to whether it will ever come back. And, you know, usually these long-term trends, this is a long-term trend, um, you know, uh, are hard to reverse. Um, so these cases, um, you know, may not go away for a long time. Even, even if the Supreme Court changes, becomes more liberal, we still have a, a body politic. Uh, can you talk about your book and how these, these things are covered in your book, Kath? Well, in, in America's religious wars, it's sort of an episodic history of, of uh, religion in American public life. And it starts with, literally, it starts with Columbus, you know, <laughs> uh, meeting the Taino and saying, you know, oh, they have no religion, they'd be so easy to convert. And then there's a chapter on the founders, particularly Washington and Jefferson. Um, and then, um, and then I, I look at um, the, the 19th century between Prote conflict between Protestant nativists and Mormons on the one hand and Catholics mm -hmm. on the other. And then it conflicts over sacred land using the story of Theodore Roosevelt and Nicholas Black Elk as um, I twine their two stories together to, to discuss that. And then the next to last chapter is on creationism. This is a conflict that oddly in the United States is now a century old and doesn't go away. And there too, I argue that some of the underlying questions are really about race. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last chapter is about, you know, race, religion, and science in conflicts over same-sex marriage. So it really covers a lot of stuff, um, but it, it, the thread is that there are these two discourses of separ separationist and foundationalist that work together in the first part of the Republic. I don't mean they were, it was just or fair or coherent, just that they, they did go together. And then they come together, come apart after the Civil War. Um, in terms of church state jurisprudence, my argument is that it is, um, I mean, this isn't happy news, but I think they are hopelessly incoherent, the religion clauses. Um, the problem with the free exercise clause is that the very thing that the religious adherent most needs is the thing that government can least afford to give, which is exemptions from laws that, that limit their practice of religion. Um, so that's a paradox. Um, and then the paradox with the establishment clause is that you can't disestablish religion. You can't separate church and state unless you know what religion is. But any definition of religion tends to establish whatever it defines. It's good to have an academic. So um, oh, really? I, feel, I feel at home today. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad. So, I mean, the, the upshot for me very simply is that these, the things we are talking about right now are very big questions of social ethics. And it's not that we shouldn't talk about religion, people's religious feelings and histories are very much a part of it, but they're deep questions of social ethics and that are, that have been, that we have tried to manage through the manipulation of the word religion. And, uh, it doesn't do the job. It doesn't carry the burden of democracy adequately for us. So I think they need to be addressed as social ethics. So thinking historically, when when do you find uh, the modern use of the term religion? What what period well, or place do you think that starts? Yeah. Well, the modern use of the word religion as a generic category, so as a spe uh, as a genus of which there are species, really I th the first. Uh, thing in the West is the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Mm -hmm. So ending or trying to end the religious wars, um, the leaders of Europe say, okay, so religion, there's more than one. There's Catholicism, there's Lutheranism, there's Calvinism, mm -hmm. there's Anglicanism. There's four of them, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and you know, Islam's right next door though. Uh, yeah. they, well, they're infidels, yeah. <laughs> so they don't matter. And Jews are right. heretics. So, right. you know, we don't have to, but it's it, the, the idea that there's a generic category mm -hmm. of religion displaces the medieval idea of one true holy Catholic religion. That so religion, you see Westphalia then is more claim about religion than about nation state? Well, it's, it, both, I know it's both, both, it's both, both right? Okay. And so what we see is that religion and nation state right from the beginning, Okay. these ideas and yes. ethnicity and race and right. race are growing up together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I'm Wonderful. connected, but like and, it or not. So Peter, you tell us how, how, does, how does <laughs> this, I mean, how does this play in history is here to help? Now that we understand, or at least in part, we understand some of these things, what does it tell us? Okay, 
uh, I want you to come back and talk about your new book, but we are running out of time. So, okay. Uh, Jane usually asks me to just quickly summarize nothing brilliant, but just sort of the takeaway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think one, one takeaway uh, from Kath is the, the need to uh, sharpen our definitions and understand the history of those definitions. So rather than tossing around the word religion, we need to be more self-conscious about what we mean, particularly when it seems to be a catch-all. And it's a catch-all in competition with secular. So I think it's a very important takeaway. And that's true here anyway. I mean, it's certainly true in Modi's India. I mean, what does Hinduism mean as a religion? Right. So, so that'd be one important takeaway. I think secondly, that uh, as Jay, you said at the beginning, uh, things have changed. They, they are not the same way. And Kath has said, at least since, since the Civil War, that they've changed. And certainly um, from her reference to segregation, I would remind us of uh, LBJ's famous comment uh, when he signed the Voting Rights Act. He gave the pen to Martin Luther King Jr. and said, I just signed away the South. That's right. And I think that uh, we're dealing with the legacy of Nixon and the white policy as well. Mm -hmm. We want to add, though, the connections between ethnicity and religion in the North, right? Uh, Irish Catholic, not to, not to, uh, no, exactly. <laughs> and, and, Chris, and Chris Gerson, president of our school, and it's, and it's not to their Jews who are saying, you know, segregationists as well, but the notion in the North as well that, that yes, of course, to yes, go, uh, yes. go together. And yes. then thirdly, um, I think probably with not much optimism towards where we're headed. Uh, and not just, as you remind us, Jay, not just 6 3 in court, but people's views in the streets. I see this as one more uh, social civil war, uh, as, as the abolitionists movement was, as the civil rights movement was, um, probably more so than Vietnam, because anti Vietnam sentiment was pretty reserved. Okay, but certainly the civil rights era and you can't find a bigger one. Um, I'm a child in many ways in the 30s. That was a tremendous civil strife, but I, that's where I look. I, I look at the streets, yeah. it's gonna, mm -hmm. streets gonna be a problem. I mean, a woman's health clinic is gonna be surrounded by people who support it, and people are shouting epithets at it, and the government is gonna say, well, you know, people shouting epithets have a right to be there, and the day is coming where the women don't have a right mm -hmm. That help. This is very important. It, it's not particularly optimistic, and no. but it is more important, perhaps, than you know the ordinary public discourse about well, the division in I the think, country. I think so as well, because the one thing that Kath hasn't said: uh, much of religious extremism is not just driven by racism, also by misogyny, also by attacks on. I mean, we're not yeah. talking about men not getting Viagra, right? Yeah. We're, so I think part of it, is, and I don't, I don't mean that in a simplistic way, but when you start peeling back. A lot of the a lot of the attacks are on women, or women should just play a traditional role. But again, that's the new society, right? The new society is uh, women in public office. The new society is women taking the pill. The new society is women having a choice. So that does worry me. I, the one point of optimism is a strange one for me: is uh, states' rights. There are still a significant number of states which will do what they can to support the great society. So we may just be split again. We're literally split. Yeah, I don't feel we're in a time of enlightenment right now. Sorry. Um, but I want to clarify one thing before we go. We're out of time, you guys. Uh, I want to clarify one thing uh, that was said here before we go. Um, I, I am personally not an infidel. I am a <laughs> fidel. I'm a fidel. J fidel. J fidel. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Cash Sands and you Peter Hoffenberg. You get high on, on tech or not? <laughs> yeah. There's no thinking allowed on think tech. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cash. We'll have you yes, back. Peter. Thank yep. you. Really Have fun. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. 
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.